this is what we did in school. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It is indeed a pleasure to see you this morning and hope as we go through the series of lessons this morning, you'll be encouraged, encouraged, and also you'll be blessed because you have been here this morning. I don't think we have any guests with us this morning, but we certainly appreciate all the members of the church here. And if you be so kind to fill out a connection card, if you have moved, if you have a new telephone number, etc., so we can update our church directory. This morning we have David is going to be reading a scripture. Ryan is going to lead us in a song. After that, Jason is going to come forth and begin our morning services this morning. <clears throat> I'd like to say again, thanks for coming, and we hope and pray as we go through the services, you'll be blessed, and you'll be an encouragement, and I hope and pray that I'm an encouragement to you. At this time, we're going to ask David to come forth and read our scripture, then we'll get into our services. David. And the Lord said, Who then is faithful and wise steward, whom his master will make the ruler of of over his household to give them the portion of food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find doing so will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say that to, say to you that he will make him ruler of all of he ha all of he has. But if the servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and the beatings that the male or female servants and to drink, to eat, drink or be drunk, the master of servants servant will come one day and when he is not looking and at an hour when he is not aware, he will cut him into into and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant whom who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes, but he who did not know yet committed the things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few for anyone who to whom much is given from his from him much will be required, and to whom has been committed, and they will ask the ask for the more. Today I will be uh, leading as the deer panteth for the water, number eight forty three, verses one and three. As the deer panteth for the water so my soul longeth after me 
Good morning. First song this morning will be number 177. God himself is with us. Let us now adore him and with all appear before him. God is in his temple, all within keeps silence, and before him bow with reverence. Him alone, God, we own to our Lord and Savior. Praises sing forever. God himself is with us, whom angelic legions serve with all in heavenly regions. Holy, 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 sing the host of heaven. Praise to God be ever given. Bow thine ear to us here. Hear, O Christ, the praises that thy church now raises. O thou fount of blessing, purify my spirit, trusting only in thy merit. Next song this morning will be number 684. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land will live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Good morning. Let us pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the privilege that we have to come before you and listen to your lessons that we teach. Heavenly Father, we ask you to open our minds to the lesson that's coming. We ask you also, Heavenly Father, 
to bless those who are watching on, online who are not able to get out. Heavenly Father, we also ask that you continue to bless this church. We ask you, Heavenly Father, all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's stand as we sing this uh, next song. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord. the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, <clears throat> Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest defenders who truly obey, that moment may enter the heavenly way. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. <clears throat> oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us. Great things he hath done. And great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear him. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Please be seated. All right, well, good morning. It's really great to, uh, to see all of you. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Um, we have been now uh, in the parables of Jesus for quite a long time. This has been quite a lengthy uh, se series within our theme for this year. I uh, hope you have enjoyed it. I hope you have been blessed by it. Uh, we are nearing the end of this particular phase. Uh, I'd like us to, to, have, to look at a couple parables this week and then a parable next week. And then after that, uh, after Thanksgiving, I'd like us to transition to one last series. It will really be more like a mini-series because of how little time is left in the year. But one last series related to following Jesus, which, of course, is our theme for the entire year. Um, I wanted the, the parables that we're going to look at this morning, I wanted them to be near the end of this series uh, for a reason. Uh, we have at this point read a good number of parables uh, from Jesus, and Jesus has taught us a number of different things through them. He's taught us about examining our hearts, and he's taught us about loving our neighbors. He's taught us about forgiving one another. 
Uh, he's taught us about what his kingdom is like and how members of that kingdom are supposed to live. So he's told us quite a bit of things so far. And this morning, Jesus tells us two parables about a time in the future when he is coming back to earth. He tells us about his second coming. Uh, now, normally, when we talk and when we pray and when we sing uh, about Jesus' second coming, we do that with a lot of joy. And we express how great it will be uh, when Jesus comes back. Uh, this fallen and broken world and this fallen way of life, uh, it will all pass away when Jesus returns. And we will live in uh, the presence of God for all eternity. And all the pain and sorrows and tragedies of this life, all of that will pass away. That is how we often talk about Jesus' second coming. And if you've been in our Sunday morning Bible class um, Lately, just last week, we read Paul and Romans uh, talk about Jesus' second coming that way as well. So again, this is how we often talk about Jesus' second coming. Now, sometimes when we think about Jesus' second coming, we might be tempted to think that we would really rather Jesus hold off on returning uh, for a while, uh, especially if our lives are going really well or if there are things in the future that we're really looking forward to and that we really want to be a part of or accomplish, um, we may sometimes feel like we're actually not in a particular hurry uh, for Jesus to come back. And sometimes, for that, for that matter, we might even wonder if Jesus is really going to come back uh, at all, because it has been 2,000 years. Uh, 2,000 years have passed since Jesus said he is coming back, and life has pretty much moved on during those 2,000 years largely the same uh, as it always has, and so we might wonder uh, if Jesus is actually going to come back at all. Well, Jesus tells us in, in the two parables that we'll look at this morning, he tells us that he really is going uh, to come back. And we know from the rest of the New Testament that when he comes back, uh, it really will be a great day for those uh, who follow him. Uh, it will be a day of joy, but Jesus really wants to stress to us in these two parables, uh, he really wants to stress to us the importance uh, of us daily living in the present in light of the promise that he's coming back one day. And while we wait for that day, he doesn't want us to forget what we're waiting for. He doesn't want us to forget who we are waiting for. And he doesn't want us to get distracted. He doesn't want us to lose focus while we wait. Uh, because if that happens then when he comes back, it might actually not be such a great day for us um, after all. So Jesus tells us two parables about waiting. Two parables about people um, who have to wait longer than they expected to wait. So what does Jesus tell us about daily living our lives in the present in light of the promise of his return? What does he tell us about that through these parables? That's what I'd like us to be thinking about uh, this morning. So this first parable involves a really happy uh, celebratory occasion in Jesus' world uh, and a celebratory occasion in our world as well. The first of these two parables involves a wedding. But it doesn't involve a wedding that's quite like today's weddings. Uh, today's weddings, typically the actual ceremony can be over in less than an hour and then there may be a reception or some type of celebration of some kind and the whole thing can be over in a few hours' time. Well, weddings in Jesus' day were big celebrations. A wedding in Jesus' day could last for seven days. It could last a whole week. So it was a big celebration. And like today's weddings, um, there were traditional things that were expected to happen uh, at a wedding. In our, in our culture, in our world, for us, those things often are things like exchanging rings, and there are bridesmaids who were selected and groomsmen who are selected and these types of things. Well, there were traditional things that were expected in Jesus' time. Uh, for weddings as well. And if someone messed up in performing one of those traditional roles, that would be really embarrassing. And in Jesus' world, that would be really shameful. And it could even be an insult to the people uh, getting married. So Jesus' parable is about one of those traditional things uh, that was supposed to happen, but some of the people assigned to their role are not able to perform their role. Uh, Jesus' parable is about ten virgins or ten bridesmaids uh, who were supposed to meet the bridegroom. 
So this is a little strange for us, but again, the weddings happened in a different culture. But part of ancient Jewish weddings involved uh, the bridesmaids leaving the bride and then meeting the groom. And then the bridesmaids would escort the groom to the bride. And then the whole group would then make their way to the wedding feast. And that group was led by the groom. The groom would lead that whole group to uh, the wedding feast. And so this procession to the wedding feast, um, it would often occur in the evening, and there would be torches or there would be lamps as part of that procession um, because it's in the evening and it's part of the celebration. Well, Jesus tells us that on this particular wedding, five of these ten virgins wisely had oil to keep their lamps lit, um, but five of them did not have any extra oil. And ordinarily, this probably would not be a problem, but in this particular instance, something delayed the groom. And Jesus doesn't bother to tell us what that is, but something delayed uh, the groom and and delayed him long into the night. And so the bridesmaids fell asleep. And then when it was announced that the bridegroom is finally coming, uh, the five who have uh, the five who do not have additional oil, well, they, they need it because their oil has run out. So they ask for the five who have uh, to share, but there's not enough to share. If they did that, then none of them would have uh, enough uh, oil to light their lamps, and none of them would be able to perform their, their very important traditional role. But if the five of them hang on to their oil, then at least half of them can perform their role. And so the five who do not have oil, they need to run out and see if they can grab some and, and come back in time before the groom arrives. But while they are out buying uh, their oil, scrambling at the last minute for that, uh, the groom comes, and the five who have their oil for their lamps, they get to escort the groom to the feast. And then when the other five finally come back, they ask to be let into the feast, but they are no longer welcome. That might sound really harsh for us today. They're no longer welcome at the feast. But in Jesus' world, their failure to escort the groom would have probably been a pretty big insult to the groom and to the groom's entire family. Um, they, have, they have publicly insulted them, so they are no longer welcome. And so, I do not know you, is what the groom uh, responds. And Jesus tells us at the conclusion of this parable that the different ways that these ten bridesmaids have acted tells us something about how and how not to watch for uh, the day and the hour of the kingdom of heaven. And we'll come back to, to some of what that uh, to, to what their actions tell us in a little bit. But that's the first of two parables on this topic of Jesus' delay and unexpected return that we'll look at this morning. The Gospel of Luke tells us of another time that Jesus spoke about his return, and he did it with pretty similar language. It's not exactly the same. It's a different parable, but the language is kind of similar. So this is actually a parable that is the prelude to the parable we will really look at, but we, re- we need this parable to get the context. So let's read this together. Jesus says, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. So there's lamps again. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast. So it's a different scenario, but we still have lamps, still have a wedding feast. So that they may, be, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom their master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So again, it's it's a little bit different here. We're talking now about a master of a house who is coming back from a wedding feast, uh, apparently not because he's getting married, but he's attending a wedding where someone is getting married. And the key here is for the servants of that house to have things ready for when the master uh, comes back. And Jesus says at the end, in the same way, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And the Apostle Peter, after that, asks a clarifying question to try to understand Jesus' parable more. And when, Jesus, uh, when he asks that question, Jesus responds by telling another parable. So Jesus answers a question about a parable with a parable. And the parable that Jesus tells us in response to Peter's question is the parable that uh, Davin read for us earlier. Jesus, in this parable, talks about the master of a house who goes away, and when he goes away, he appoints a manager. He appoints a head servant over his house. 
And Jesus says that a faithful manager, a wise manager, will treat the other servants in a way that is fair and right. He will give them what they need. He will give them the right amount of food at the right time. He will take care of them. And a manager who does this, who does his job uh, faithfully while the master is away, who knows, he may be promoted to, uh, to be the regular overseer of the master's household. A little bit like Joseph in the Old Testament who was promoted to oversee everything in Potiphar's house. But that's not the only choice the head servant has. The head servant could make another choice while the master is away. When the master takes longer to come back than what was expected, the servant may begin to feel like he's got plenty of time. Uh, he's got time to kill, and his master isn't here to keep an eye on him, and he can use this new power that he has uh, the way that he wants, uh, which is not necessarily, of course, the way the master wants. And so he begins to indulge himself. He's feasting and he's drinking, and instead of treating the other servants well, uh, giving them the right amount of food at the right time, uh, he turns to abusing them instead. And, and after all, why can't he do that? Because the master isn't there uh, to stop him. But Jesus says that this servant gets carried away. Maybe he loses track of time. And at an hour that he did not expect, that he did not anticipate, um, the master returns. And he returns to find his household in complete disorder. And what the master does is very severe. Jesus says that the master will cut that servant into pieces. And the discipline does not just stop there with the head servant. Everyone who joined in with that head servant and knew better is given a severe beating. And those who didn't know the master's will, but they still did what rightfully deserved a beating, they will receive a lighter one. And Jesus gives the principle behind the parable at the end. He says, everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. So in answer to Peter's question, Lord, are you telling this parable for us, for your disciples, or for everyone? Jesus seems to be saying, yes, it is for everyone, but it's especially for you disciples. More is expected of you. It is especially for you. So we have two parables, both of them about Jesus' return. Both of them involve Jesus returning after some delay and returning at a time that is unexpected. And even though there are a lot of passages uh, that talk about Jesus' return with joy and with eager expectation about what a great day that will be and when the eternal age begins, even though there are a lot of passages like that, these passages are not so cheery. Uh, they're warnings to us instead. Uh, what so, so what do they tell us about how to live our daily lives in the present in light of Jesus' return? What do these warning passages tell us? Well, the first parable about the ten virgins, I think, has a pretty clear message. Don't be like the five foolish bridesmaids who were unprepared. That's basically the message. Don't be like them. Be like the five who were prepared. Be like the five who watched because they did not know the day or the hour. And so what does it mean for followers of Jesus to watch, to be alert for his return? Well, in the parable, uh, that meant being prepared to meet the groom when he came, having the oil so that whenever he comes, you're prepared to greet him uh, according to the way you're supposed to. Well, when Jesus comes, will we be ready to greet him? What does it mean to be ready to greet Jesus? I think the second parable that we looked at makes that clear. Those who are ready to greet Jesus are those who are doing his will when he returns. We watch for Jesus' coming by following his teachings. We show we are ready for his return by living as though he is already here. And Jesus tells us that following him in this way, that continuing to follow his teachings while he's away, that may be a long commitment because again, here we are 2,000 years later, and we are still waiting for his return. And it may be that like all Christians who have lived before us, it may be that our lives may be over before he returns. And if that happens, that means we're looking at a lifelong commitment to following Jesus. A lifelong commitment to loving our neighbors as ourselves. A lifelong commitment to even loving our enemies. 
a lifelong commitment to forgiving others when we're wronged, just like uh, God and Christ has forgiven us. A lifelong commitment to sowing the seeds of the kingdom and a lifelong commitment to letting the kingdom grow within our own hearts and fostering that growth also within the hearts of our brothers and sisters. Jesus is saying that because we don't know when he is returning, our lives should be consistently focused on following him so that when he does return, he finds his people actually living the way he taught them to live. Following Jesus is good. Following Jesus is the best decision a person can make. Following Jesus means grace and peace. It means joy. It means eternal life, living eternally in his presence when he returns. But Jesus wants us to remember that following him is also a responsibility. It is a commitment. We don't know when Jesus will return. It may be in our lifetimes, or it may not. And if it's not in our lifetimes, it's still true that we don't know how many days we have left before our lives are over. It may be several decades, it may be a few years, maybe a few months, or maybe even less than that. We don't know. And so no matter which comes first, our passing or his return, we will meet the Lord one day, one way or the other. And when we meet him, will he find us ready? When we meet him, will we be glad to see him? And will he be glad to see us? If we are genuinely following him, the answers to those questions will be yes. And so let's follow him. And this morning, if you would like to begin that journey of following him, coming to him in faith and repentance on the basis of what he has done for us and being buried with him in baptism, or this morning, if perhaps you need to renew that commitment to following him, you can come forward and, and, and uh, receive prayer publicly from this church. You can approach me or one of the shepherds or one of the deacons or anyone you're willing to talk to for prayer and encouragement. But we encourage you, um, if, if you have a need, to come now while together we stand and while Jason leads us in our song of invitation. Who will follow Jesus standing for the right? Holding up his banner in the thickest fight. Listening for his orders, ready to obey. Who will follow Jesus serving him today? Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in life's busy ways, working for the Master, giving him praise, earnest in his vineyard, honoring his laws, faithful to his counsel, watchful for his cause. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in his work of love? Leading others to him, lifting prayers above. Courage, faithful servant, in his word we see. On our side forever will this Savior be. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? 
Lord sigh, Master, here am I. Please be seated. Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a lowly birth? Because he loved me so. This morning, just like every Sunday morning, we gather around the Lord's table to take communion. And uh, as we don't know when our time is going to be up here on earth, it's a reminder that we need to do what's right each and every Sunday morning. And as Lee said earlier, it's been uh, 2,000 years since Christ has been was crucified and died for our sins. And for every week from then until now, we have the responsibility to come here and take communion every Sunday morning. And we don't want to be the group that uh, forgets about it or for, gets out of the habit of it because it would be easy to not, not follow what we should do. So it's a good reminder every Sunday morning that we come here to remember his crucifixion, his resurrection, and to have communion here in the presence of God. In uh, Matthew chapter 26... In uh, verse 26, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Let us give thanks for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this time this morning to come here and to remember the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for our sins that we may have eternal life. Be with us this morning as we take this bread that represents Christ's body. In his name we pray. Amen. Continuing in verse 27, and he took the cup and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this fruit of the vine that represents Christ's shed blood. We realize how he suffered on that cross for us, and it is our responsibility to follow him in his footsteps and to lead the life that you want us to. Be with us this morning. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, 
Separate from the Lord's Supper is the offering. And I, I missed exactly what verse it was that Davin read for us this morning, but I caught the tail end of it when it said, well, for those whose much is given, much is expected. And I think we can all fit into that category. We've all been blessed in so many different ways, and this is a chance for us to give back to, to God to show how much we love and appreciate all that he's done for us. So let's give thanks for this offering. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can have come to give back an offering to you. We're so thankful for this beautiful place that we live and all of the many blessings that you give us. And please be with us as we give back and let us to remember how thankful and appreciative we all are for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us for worship uh, today. I uh, hope this has been a, a blessed time for you. I have just a few announcements uh, to, to make before we dismiss. Uh, we will meet for our small group uh, Bible study tonight at 5 p.m. to discuss a little bit more about these two parables. So if you're able to be here, I encourage you to be, uh, be there for that. Also, this morning, we have a special collection. In addition to our regular collection, there is a, a plate in the back uh, at the table right right as you exit the auditorium. And the money that goes into that plate will be taken up for the Potter's Home. That's a children's home run by Churches of Christ. And uh, we, we like to support them and support the good work that they're doing. And so anything that goes in that plate will go there. And if you're uh, ready and able and willing, I encourage you to leave a donation there. Also, if you're attending the last leaders uh, convention this spring, uh, please see Mary Carpenter. We need to pre-register everyone for that in advance. Uh, so please see her or contact her in some way and let her know about that. Um, ladies Bible study is coming up November 20th at 10 a.m. And our sister Doris Bradley will be presenting that. So uh, ladies, encourage you to mark your calendar and be there if you can. If you have the workbook, please bring one. If you do not, uh, contact Miss Tammy and we can they can arrange one. Uh, but I uh, encourage you to be there for that if you're able. Also, uh, just this morning, right after worship, downstairs... The young adult small group will be meeting together for a meal, and from what I understand, it is quite the spread. Uh, we have a lot of food, and so even if you don't consider yourself part of young adult small group, I don't think anyone will turn you away by any means, and you are welcome to come and be part of that. Um, a couple of announcements I was made aware of just before uh, getting up here. One is on December the 4th, is that right? Saturday, December the 4th, will be Secret Sister Reveal, and if that sounds strange, it's because... We weren't able to do Secret Sister for a while, but no one ever found out who their Secret Sisters were last time they did it. So we're going to reveal that, and I think they're wanting to do another another round of that, I, maybe? Okay. So Secret Sister reveal at December, December 4th, Saturday. Um, also, I was handed this prayer request uh, in addition to the prayer request we took before Bible class this morning. Let's be praying for our sister, Stephanie Crawford. She is, uh, just wanted to mention that she's not feeling well and is requesting prayer, so encourage you to lift her up uh, in prayer throughout this week. Um, let's see. Oh, also, the, um, the youth lock-in. That should be on here. I apologize that it's not. That is on the 12th, so next Friday from 6.30 p.m. to 9 a.m. So uh, if you're able to be there for all or part of that, that would be great. But that will be a fun time for the youth. Um, those are all the announcements I'm seeing right now. Is there anything else that needs to be mentioned before we dismiss? Ms. Jones. Okay, so if you don't mind leaving your communion cups in the pew, they will be collected. Uh, Ernie. We have a special class next week for teenagers for food preparation. Yes, there will be a special class for the teenagers uh, next week, and so I think it will be a, a beneficial time to discuss some really meaningful and important things for their walks with God, and so uh, if you're able to be there for that, I encourage you to be there. Yes, yeah, the girls will be with Kelsey, the boys will be with Chris, and I think that will be a, a meaningful class. So if you're able to be there, I encourage you to be there for that. Anything else that needs to be mentioned? All right, well, um, if you would be standing, and we'll have our closing song and our closing prayer. Take the name 
of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where you go, precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven, precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven, take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptation shrouds you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet. Our Heavenly Father, we bring to you Stephanie this morning that's feeling bad, that you will give her a healing hand, Lord, and bring her back to us to worship. Heavenly Father, we pray for the, the rest of our sick people that, that we got on our sick list, that you will comfort them and, and heal them. Heavenly Father, we pray for the upcoming stuff that children's uh, Bible study and stuff that's coming up and they might just learn more and keep wanting to listen to more and hear, hear more. And your Father, we thank you for this day, the sunshine, and we pray that you will be with us this coming up, upcoming week, that we continue to try to save souls and and talk to people about their souls in jesus name name we pray amen <laughs> 